fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and its annexation by the Nazis. It was a strange, chaotic and exciting time to be in the city. Gödel studied mathematics at Vienna University, but he spent most of his time in the cafes, the internet chat rooms of their time, where amongst games of backgammon and billiards, the real intellectual excitement was taking place. Particularly amongst a highly influential group of philosophers and scientists called the Vienna Circle. In their discussions, Kurt Gödel would come up with an idea that would revolutionise mathematics. He'd set himself a difficult mathematical test. He wanted to solve Hilbert's second problem and find a logical foundation for all mathematics. But what he came up with surprised even him. All his efforts in mathematical logic not only couldn't provide the guarantee Hilbert wanted, instead, he proved the opposite. Got it. It's called the incompleteness theorem. Gödel proved that within any logical system for mathematics, there will be statements about numbers which are true, but which you cannot prove. He starts with the statement, this statement cannot be proved. This is not a mathematical statement yet. But by using a clever code based on prime numbers, Gödel could change this statement into a pure statement of arithmetic. Now, such statements must either be true or false. Hold on to your logical hats as we explore the possibilities. If the statement is false, that means the statement could be proved, which means it would be true, and that's a contradiction. So that means the statement must be true. In other words, here is a mathematical statement that is true, but can't be proved. Mars. Gödel's proof led to a crisis in mathematics. What if the problem you're working on, the Goldbach conjecture, say, or the Riemann hypothesis, would turn out to be true, but unprovable? It led to a crisis for Gödel, too. In the autumn of 1934, he suffered the first of what became a series of breakdowns and spent time in a sanatorium. He was saved by the love of a good woman. Adele Nimbersky was a dancer in a local nightclub. She kept Gödel alive. One day, she and Gödel were walking down these very steps. Suddenly, he was attacked by Nazi thugs. Gödel himself wasn't Jewish, but many of his friends in the Vienna Circle were. Adele came to his rescue. But it was only a temporary reprieve for Gödel and for Mats. All across Austria and Germany, mathematics was about to die. In the new German Empire in the late 1930s, there weren't colourful balloons flying over the universities, but swastikas. The Nazis passed a law allowing the removal of any civil servant who wasn't Aryan. Academics were civil servants in Germany then and now. Mathematicians suffered more than most. 144 in Germany would lose their jobs. 14 were driven to suicide or died in concentration camps. But one brilliant mathematician stayed on. David Hilbert helped arrange for some of his brightest students to flee. And he spoke out for a while about the dismissal of his Jewish colleagues. But soon he too became silent. It's not clear why he didn't flee himself, or at least protest a little bit more. He did fall ill towards the end of his life, so maybe he just didn't have the energy. All around him, mathematicians and scientists were fleeing the Nazi regime, until it was only Hilbert left to witness the destruction, one of the greatest mathematical centres of all time. David Hilbert died in 1943. Only ten people attended the funeral of the most famous mathematician of his time. The dominance of Europe, the centre for world maths for 500 years was over. It was time for the mathematical baton to be handed to the new world. Time, in fact, for this place. The Institute for Advanced Study had been set up in Princeton in 1930. The idea was to reproduce the collegiate atmosphere of the old European universities in rural New Jersey. But to do this, it needed to attract the very best, and it didn't need to look far. 
many of the brightest European mathematicians were fleeing the Nazis for America. People like Hermann Weyl, whose research would have major significance for theoretical physics. And John von Neumann, who developed game theory and was one of the pioneers of computer science. The Institute quickly became the perfect place to create another Göttingen in the woods. One mathematician in particular made the place a home from home. Every morning, Kurt Gödel, dressed in a white linen suit and wearing a fedora, would walk from his home along Mercer Street to the Institute. On his way, he would stop here at number 112 to pick up his closest friend, another European exile, Albert Einstein. But not even relaxed, affluent Princeton could help Gödel finally escape his demons. Einstein was always full of laughter. He described Princeton as a banishment to paradise. But the much younger Gödel became increasingly solemn and pessimistic. Slowly, this pessimism turned into paranoia. He spent less and less time with his fellow mathematicians in Princeton. Instead, he preferred to come here, to the beach next to the ocean, walk alone, thinking about the works of the great German mathematician Leibniz. But as Gödel was withdrawing into his own interior world, his influence on American mathematics, paradoxically, was growing stronger and stronger. And a young mathematician from just along the New Jersey coast eagerly took on some of the challenges he posed. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times a day I could love you. In 1950s America, the majority of youngsters weren't preoccupied with mathematics. Most went for a more relaxed, hedonistic lifestyle in this newly affluent land of ice cream and donuts. But one teenager didn't indulge in the normal pursuits of American adolescence, but chose instead to grapple with some of the major problems in mathematics. From a very early age, Paul Cohen was winning mathematical competitions and prizes. But he found it difficult at first to discover a field in mathematics where he could really make his mark. Until he read about Cantor's continuum hypothesis. That's the one problem, as I'd learned back in Halle, that Cantor just couldn't resolve. It asks whether there is or isn't an infinite set of numbers bigger than the set of all whole numbers, but smaller than the set of all decimals. It sounds straightforward but it had foiled all attempts to solve it since Hilbert made it his first problem way back in 1900. With the arrogance of youth, the 22-year-old Paul Cohen decided that he could do it. Cohen came back a year later with the extraordinary discovery that both answers could be true. There was one mathematics where the continuum hypothesis could be assumed to be true. There wasn't a set between the whole numbers and the infinite decimals. But there was an equally consistent mathematics where the continuum hypothesis could be assumed to be false. Here, there was a set between the whole numbers and the infinite decimals. It was an incredibly daring solution. Kern's proof seemed true, but his method was so new that nobody was absolutely sure. There was only one person whose opinion everybody trusted. There was a lot of scepticism, and he had to come and make a trip here to the Institute right here to visit Gödel, and it was only after Gödel gave his stamp of approval in quite an unusual way by said, give me your paper, and then on Monday he put it back in the box there saying, yes, it's correct. Uh, then, of course, everything changed. Today, mathematicians insert a statement that says whether the result depends on the continuum hypothesis. We've built up two different mathematical worlds in which one answer is yes and the other is no. Paul Cohen really has rocked the mathematical universe. It gave him fame, riches and prizes galore. He didn't publish much okay. after his early success in the 60s. But he was absolutely uh, dynamite. I can't imagine anyone better to learn from. And he was very eager to learn, to teach you anything he knew, or even things he didn't know. With the confidence that came from solving Hilbert's first problem, Kern settled down in the mid-1960s to have a go at the most important Hilbert problem of them all, the eighth 
the Riemann hypothesis. When he died in California in 2007, 40 years later, he was still trying. But like many famous mathematicians before him, Riemann had defeated even him. But his approach has inspired others to make progress towards a proof, including one of his most famous students, Peter Sarnak. I think uh, overall, absolutely, I loved the guy. It was my inspiration. Uh, I'm really glad I worked with him. He put me on the right track. Paul Cohen is a good example of the success of the great American dream. Second generation Jewish immigrant becomes top American professor. But I wouldn't say that his mathematics was a particularly American product. Cohen was so fired up by this problem that he probably would have cracked it whatever the surroundings. Paul Cohen had it relatively easy. But another great American mathematician of the 1960s faced a much tougher struggle to make an impact. Not least because she was female. In the story of maths, nearly all the truly great mathematicians have been men. But there have been a few exceptions. There was the Russian Sofia Kovalevskaya, who became the first female professor of mathematics in Stockholm in 1889 and won a very prestigious French mathematical prize. And then Emmy Noethe, a talented algebraist who fled from the Nazis to America, but then died before she fully realised her potential. And then there is the woman whom I am crossing America to find out about, Julia Robinson, the first woman ever to be elected president of the American Mathematical Society. She was born in St. Louis in 1919, but her mother died when she was two. She and her sister Constance moved to live with their grandmother in a small community in the desert near Phoenix, Arizona. Julia Robinson grew up somewhere around here. I've got a photo which shows her cottage in the 1930s uh, with nothing much around it. And the mountains pretty much match those over there, so I think she might have lived just down there. Julia grew up a shy, sickly girl, who when she was seven spent a year in bed because of scarlet fever. Her ill health persisted throughout her childhood. She was told she wouldn't live past 40. But right from the start, she had an innate mathematical ability. Under the shade of the native Arizona cactus, she whiled away the time playing with endless counting games with stone pebbles. This early searching for patterns will give her a feel and love of numbers which would last for the rest of her life. But despite showing an early brilliance, she had to continually fight at school and college simply to be allowed to keep doing mathematics. As a teenager, she was the only girl in the maths class, but had very little encouragement. So the young Julia sought intellectual stimulation elsewhere. Julia loved listening to a radio show called The University Explorer, and the 53rd episode was all about mathematics. The broadcaster described how he discovered that despite their esoteric language and their seclusive nature, mathematicians are the most interesting and inspiring creatures. For the first time, Julia had found out that there were mathematicians, not just mathematics teachers, that there was a world of mathematics out there, and she wanted to be part of it. The doors to that world would open here at the University of California at Berkeley near San Francisco. She was absolutely obsessed that she wanted to go to Berkeley. Uh -huh. Not to Berkeley, she wanted to go away, someplace where there were mathematicians. Berkeley certainly had mathematicians, including a number theorist called Raphael Robinson. In their frequent walks around the campus, they found that they had more than just a passion for mathematics. They married in 1952. Julia got her PhD and settled down to what would turn out to be her lifetime's work, Hilbert's tenth problem. She thought about it a 